Hi, and welcome to the next edition of More or Less. I'm Peggy. I'm Cody. I'm James Dixon. And we are very happy to be here for our January podcast. Uh, with January, it's the turning of a calendar, start of a new year. A lot of people make resolutions. Um, Cody, did you make a New Year's resolution this year? Uh, yes, I am uh, intentionally uh, leading uh, as a servant this year. Um, servant leadership is my focus at home and at work. Amazing. What about you, James? I did. I'm focused on uh, a couple of things. One of them is setting the world record for amputees, uh, you know, limb differential athletes when it comes to powerlifting. And the other one is just to become a, an even more active and impactful father. And you, Peggy? Fantastic. Um, so I actually did not make a resolution. We instead decided to choose a word for the family to try to work on throughout the year. And our word this year is kindness. So we are going to try to focus on being kind to each other, being kind to the community and responding to conflict with kindness. So it's definitely going to be an all year project, but I think it'll be worthwhile. So none of us chose the New Year's resolution. That is the topic of today's podcast, but that's okay. I know a lot of our listeners have. And today we're going to be talking about health and fitness, especially health and fitness focused after limb loss or limb difference. Uh, before we kind of dive into the topic, I do want to remind everybody, anytime you make any changes to your diet or to your activity level, uh, before you embark on any fitness program or change your diet drastically, please speak with your physician, reach out to your GP, make sure that what you plan on doing is healthy and is the right choice for you. We're going to be talking about our experiences and throwing out some ideas, but the information that we're providing does not and should never replace medical information from your own physician. So that's our disclaimer. And um, I think we're going to start with Cody. Yes. And I want to dive in. Thank you so much, Peggy. I want to dive into uh, life with limb loss and limb, limb difference and what that means for our health, what that means for our longevity and all of the different aspects of, you know, you know, how this can affect uh, how we treat our health, how we come to making changes, um, why we should think about those things. So I just want to say that, you know, living with limb loss or limb difference uh, creates an intentional aspect to life that people with, um, we'll say whole bodies don't necessarily have. Uh, you know, we have to intentionally put on a prosthesis in the morning to get up and walk. We have to intentionally um, note where we're stepping, what kind of surface are we on, um, what obstacles are in our way, am I flexing my muscles correctly in the socket, and I'm, you know, paying attention to my skin care, so on and so forth. There are many aspects to life that we have to be more intentional about. Now, as time goes by, those things become na our nature. Uh, and so we don't necessarily think we're thinking about them much, but we actually are. It's just who we, who we are and what we do. Um, and we do those things, like I said, more so than people with whole bodies. So um, specifically speaking about health and our, our diet, our exercise plans, um, in our choices that we make, we have to be intentional because we have immediate and long-term effects that are more dramatic and more drastic and more rapid than, um, than more immediate than, uh, those with whole bodies. Um, so when we, you know, I'll, I'll just say if we were to go and eat like a plate of nachos and drink a beer one night, the next day, we're going to feel that we're going to not necessarily fit into our prosthesis well. And there's the opposite effect. If we lose weight, um, you know, if we're um, beginning on an exercise program, we're going to see a change in our socket fits and things like that. Um, and that's just one aspect of the immediate changes that we can feel. Now, um, 
I'm going to dive into a few more reasons why we want to be intentional about our health and our, our, our diet and exercise in particular. Um, I'm going to start off with, with, there was a study done, uh, released, I should say, last year that showed, and I'll, I'll want to read it for you all, this, this, this high-level overview of a lengthy study, and we'll post this somewhere and um, let you know. But um, this study went over basically cardiorespiratory um, issues once someone has gone through an amputation. So here's a summary that was written. The loss of body mass, which is an amputation, either lower or upper limb, where arterial flow and venous return has been drastically reduced, results in atrophy of the heart tissues. That means the heart actually has been shown to get smaller. Our heart rate is higher across all activity levels, even when we are at rest. So even our baseline heart rate is increased above those who have all of their limbs. We also have a lower stroke volume in our hearts. So that means our hearts are not pumping blood out at a, at a regular volume. Okay. So what it's saying is our body adapts overall to amputation, not just at the amputation site. And this means that the amputee is at higher risk for heart conditions. So essentially we're already working at a deficit, not only a deficit in the loss of the limb and dealing with how do I, you know, maneuver in my life physically, just in my environment? How do I manipulate a prosthesis? But our hearts, our internal physiology has changed based upon the loss of arterial mass and venous return. Okay. So when we're looking at that down the corridor of time, we have to be more intentional about making sure that we keep our hearts healthy. Now, does that mean that we can't and and are are you know totally held down and 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 um, unable to ever reach peak performance and peak health no that doesn't mean that at all it just means that we have to think about these things um more readily and and um you know with other circumstances driving us toward you know health than people with like i said all of their limbs okay um, let me talk about real quick the, the causes of amputation. So the main causes of amputation in the United States, in fact, in the world, but in the United States, 54% uh, of all amputations are from vascular issues. That includes diabetes, okay? Um, that's 1.08 million people were, at the time that this statistic was written, this has been several years, but um, they were amputated because of vascularity issues, many of which, and not all, mind you, not all, because some vascularity issues are hereditary and genetic, and you can't avoid them, and that's absolutely understandable, but the vast majority of those cases could have been avoided with better diet and better exercise, okay? Um, and only, and 45% were trauma, so I just want to give you that comparison there. Most amputations occur from vascular um, deficits. Okay. So that's another reason why we also want to come to the larger community and say, Hey, look, you know, these conditions can be worked on and, and saved off so that we can avoid amputation. Um, and we want to share that with the broader community, especially, um, the diabetic community and explain, why it's so important for us to control our sugar, to control our diets, um, and then also to control our heart rate. And, and for the general population, I don't think that they understand. And I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, it's at their fault. I just think people don't know the, the long-term ramifications of not paying attention to what should my heart rate be when I exercise and how long should I exercise per week? And if you go to like the American Heart Association's website, they'll give you a target heart rate level and they'll tell you based on your age and your gender and your um, uh, height and all of these different demographics that you need to get your heart rate at a certain level for so much time per day. 
And so going out into the world and researching these things, at least at, you know, their surface level to get a good bead on, you know, how to maintain your health. It's absolutely vital to one, staving off the effects of, you know, possibly limb loss, um, but also, you know, um, early death, you know, this is, this is absolutely important. So um, that being said, you know, let's live our lives with intention, with focus, um, and at least a little more than we generally do. And I only say that based upon um, statistics. Not everybody out there is ignoring their health. I understand that. I'm not speaking to you necessarily. Um, although what you're doing, keep it up if you, if you are in control of your health. But um, because we have had such a high epidemic of people with diabetes and vascular disease um, becoming amputees, we really want to push this as, you know, this is what is going to help to maintain our health and stave off these, these issues. So uh, it's a plea. I'm pleading with you. <laughs> I think it's great information and a great reminder how, you know, little things can add up and make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, You know, I think as, as somebody who, you know, has struggled with my weight my entire life. And I will tell you that after I became an amputee for the first few years, I kind of gave myself permission. Right. I mean, because nobody is going to tell the person with one leg to go to the gym and start moving but that's exactly what I needed to hear. Um, And I would like to kind of hop over to James now, who is our gym person um, and is very into physical fitness. And I think he can provide some starting information. Again, not medical information, just anecdotal. How do you get started? What do you do? How do you walk into a gym and feel confident the first time? I'll tell you, I just fake it. You just, you know, if, if you go into a gym and it's something that you're not really comfortable with, just, you know, pretend like you are. That's my advice. So, James, what if you have? Well, Peggy, man, thanks for the, for the uh, football there. I wanted to say something and piggyback off of Cody. Um, this, the vascularity issues is how I became an amputee. Uh, 33 surgeries before I was 11. I spent most of my life as an amputee. I, I do, I've never walked without assistance. I've never known a step in my life that didn't need uh, some supportive system, whether it be a brace, a buildup, or prosthetic. But I can tell you that my atrophy or the weakness that developed in my leg during the years I wasn't walking motivated me to start doing physical things because I wanted acceptance validation or involvement with people who were uh, full-bodied. One of the things that I found in going to the gym is that I did have that insecurity, that uh, the oddness or the idea that everyone's looking at me, especially if it came to going into the, to go swimming or do anything of those things. Um, So one of the things that I found that helped me in that insecurity aspect of it, uh, because the, the even your, your ankle may look different, your the leg or the way your sweatpants may grab around the leg will be different, and people will notice. And rather than us feel insecure or insignificant or uh, like all eyes are on us, one of the things that we can do is if you want to feel more comfortable, there are a lot of gyms that after this January rush, when everyone does the resolution, it dies down nearly February, it really dies down. Um, But you can go at times that are not peak times. You can get a time with a personal trainer, sharing times with them. They will have you come in at times where it's not busy because you need use and access um, to equipment. It's very important that we have someone show us the right way to lift for our safety and create adaptive workouts. I don't try to do what everyone else does. I have to do what is best for me as an amputee. And I encourage you to do the same. Everything has an adaptive, where there's a novice, an intermediate, and an expert level. You don't need to prepare for the NFL. You need to prepare for life so that you're not for long 
on earth. We are going after um, wanting to live full lives and impact our lives. What Cody brought up was the fact that our lives can be tremendously affected and short uh, as a result of the uh, the heart uh, situation that can happen. Peggy, when you mentioned that after our amputations, you're right, people lower expectations upon us. And we'll even say uh, it's okay or tolerated or even encouraged for us not to be active, full participants in life. But all of us have great value that we can add to life. You have a skill set that's so unique, so different, that what you bring to the table, no one else can duplicate. It's important that we take control of our health, what we eat. Um, eating healthy for yourself and having uh, your blood work done, um, talking to your doctor before you begin your exercise, and then having a way that you develop and you amp up the workouts in accordance to communication with uh, your, your, your professionals. Um, I do want to say this, though. When you do go in, a lot of it's important that you talk to a trainer before just hiring someone or asking for their assistance. I know in a lot of places they have trainers there who watch just videos and then they're certified within that facility to at least show you how to use a machine. That's not the same as someone who is, you have to ask them, have you ever worked with anyone or do you have a history of working with someone who has lost limbs or recovered? And because you don't want someone who's simply going to grab you, take Cody into the gym and say, Cody, we're starting off with 300 pounds. Peggy, right now, 10 miles. Well, you know, all of that stuff sounds great and all that, but we would destroy ourselves. <laughs> and it's the quickest way not to come back. Um, for me, this journey to go from um, where I've lost a total of about 90 pounds. When I was overweight, I was 200 and 90, almost 90 pounds, came down to about 200, and through the course of many years developed, and I built up with my natural weight is about 260. Uh, that's not the norm for everyone, you know, but you have to find what's a maintenance mode for your body. Um, because, Cody, I don't know about you or Peggy, if I lose weight, my prosthetic fits totally different. If I gain weight, it fits totally different. If I gain more than 15 I almost have to get a whole new prosthetic. So I have to be cautious, you know, um, and that because as, as it gets tighter, I end up with some skin issues or some uh, rubbing or you guys ever experienced any of those things and trying to do a regimen, but you developed uh, and a side effect that, that gave you a setback. Either one of you ever experienced those things? It's so frustrating and I hear it all the time. You know, you tr as amputees, we try to get healthy right? Uh, my friends and I will we'll talk about it. You know, you'll go start going to the gym, you go to your doctor, you change your diet, you're getting healthy, because it's the right thing to do because of all of the reasons that Cody just talked about. And you lose about 15, 20 pounds. And boom, all of a sudden, you're disabled because your your leg doesn't fit anymore. And then you have to go through insurance and you have a high copay if, if you have that. And it almost, feel, it's frustrating, James, because it almost feels like you get punished when you try to get healthy because then you, you get hit in the wall with a bunch of red tape and thousands of dollars for copays out of pocket and you're uncomfortable and you get to the point where like, well, I was actually walking better when I was fat because I had a leg that fit. Now I'm getting thin and I'm doing what everybody else is telling me to do and I can't walk anymore. And it's really easy to kind of give up at that point. And what I would tell people is, is everybody that, that is an amputee that uses the device, a prosthesis, and has embarked on any kind of weight loss regimen and has achieved about the 15 or 20 pounds. We all know what that's like. Call your prosthetist, talk to them. There are things that they can do. There are modifications that they can do to your socket to kind of get you through that so you don't have to keep getting socket after socket after socket. And you're not always shelling out thousands of dollars. You lose a certain amount of weight and you're in the wrong category foot. And then you have to start all over again. Um, and it can feel like punishment and it's really not, but I know that it's a frustration that a lot of people feel. It, I want to jump in and say something, especially about the 
prosthetics. Baker uh, is a phenomenal place. And the reason why I want to mention Baker specifically is that for me, um, prosthetics, I could break them easily, um, especially because I try to do heavier, heavier lifting. And uh, because I'm going for goals that are a little bit different, do not do what I've done or what I'm doing. You have to find out what's right for you. Um, but Baker knew what my goals were and began and built a prosthetic that would allow me in everyday usage um, to be able to do lifting, to do my walking, to do my running. But it's, it takes someone that has a knowledge of what your goals are and they can modify, they can work with. There are so many different solutions that were not available to me two years ago or five years ago. Things change. It's important that we don't think one prosthetic that you got in 1989 is the one you need to be having today. You should constantly be staying up on that because don't resign yourself to think that I've got a one leg, this is it, uh, copay is going to be too much, or this will be that. You have no idea just how compassionate or what may open, what doors may be open or what may happen. You need to find and have a prosthetic that is built for the life that you're trying to live. And what you mentioned, uh, they can modify, they can make adjustments, suggestions, or even come up with a game plan so that you're able to uh, not put your life on pause. Because when we stop being active, we start whittling away. Yeah, let me jump in there. Thank you very much for all of this. This is, it's good, it's good food for everybody to chew on, think of. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of solutions for the issues that you come up against, including financial, um, talk to your prosthetist about the plans you have, and they should be able to help you with the funding. They should be able to help you with the fit. They should be able to help you with, um, activity related goals. There's also, um, organizations out there that can help you. Uh, to achieve recreational prosthetics, such as the uh, Challenged Athletes Foundation. Um, that, that's a great organization. They, they do uh, grants. They put out uh, application process in September every year, um, and then they start awarding those in about April of the following year. So um, if you're interested in that, you've been in APT for over a year, talk to your process about that. But, um, you know, I want to give a real quick just testimony to what it means to start this journey and follow it through to um, a goal. Uh, I myself, um, I used to weigh about 270 pounds and I'm only five foot six and I have one leg. So if you think about that, my pants were pretty big and I started to uh, work in a laborious field and do a lot of, you know, sweaty work and things like that. And I got down, you know, to about 220 or so. And that was great. And that was a, but that took several years to get there. Um, I wasn't necessarily eating right, but I was much more active, but I took my health into my hand, my own hands. And I started with baby steps. And I think it's important to, to note that that's a, that's a good segue is to, is to start baby stepping into this. And I set a little goal of working out for about five minutes a night, start or stop eating certain kinds of foods that, um, you know, I had read about were, were not necessarily good for us. And, and I didn't know anything about diet and exercise, but I just set these little bitty goals. And then I said, you know, if, if I don't start doing all these things that I think are hard, they're never going to get easy. And I just held on to that. And then I said, you know, once this thing that's hard becomes easy, I need to do the next thing that seems hard and try that and move forward and move forward. And so I kept adding time to my workouts and I, I stopped eating even more things that I, I had heard were not good for me. And I lost uh, about 45 pounds in about two months. And I'm not going to say that's the wow. you know, effect that everybody's going to have, but I started down this journey. I held on to my uh, mantra, my belief, my you know goal, and I actually didn't really have a, a, a real 
target target goal just knew that I needed to lose weight and sure enough I I did it and I didn't realize that you know once you get past that beginning phase these things can become easier for you um another little thing I did that I never thought was going to be possible one time I I started swimming and I'd never done laps before in my life I'd always gotten a pool and splashed around like everybody does and cannonballs um, but I started doing laps in an Olympic size pool at a YMCA and I did seven laps on my first day and I thought I'm going to die. <laughs> this is the worst thing I've ever put my body through. And I looked up, I was like leaning on the side of the pool, like trying to catch my breath and I'm hanging there. I see a sign that says uh, 35 of those laps that you just did. That's down and back is one. 35 of those is a mile. And I said, well, I'm never going to do that because that was insane what I just did in seven. And I said, maybe one day, but I don't think I'm ever going to do that. Two weeks to the day, I went a mile. And, awesome. and I'll, I want to speak to, the, to what happened there. And that was a very monumental occasion. And I think that we talk about it, but I'm, I'm a living experience here. You will sometimes come up against walls in your life. And if you stick to what you're doing, you keep trying. If you don't have some other underlying issues going on to keep you from doing it and you're of normal, decent health, you can break through those walls and those barriers and you can reach new peaks and, and you can achieve things that you didn't think possible. So just know that I'm, I'm only coming to you with anything I've done from personal experience, not some fad, not nothing that, you know, it's just, you know, parables and proverbs that I've heard that I've never actually lived through. These things are lived out. Um, it is possible. You know, so. I think when you're talking about breaking down walls, my mind immediately goes to we're not the Kool-Aid man, you want to do more chip away at it and get through it kind of Shawshank Redemption style rather than Kool-Aid man where he just bursts through. That slow and steady really is the way to go. Not only does it safeguard your own health, um, but you know, small, small changes are much more likely to become long-term habits that you can you know, go, I'm going to do this and do jump into the, the deep end of a fad diet or fad workout that's completely unsustainable. It's much better to make those small baby steps towards a better goal, towards the bigger goal. And eventually you will get there if you give yourself time. You didn't get into this situation overnight. You're not going to get yourself out of it overnight. Yeah. And I think oh. if you start making goals that are too specific, you'll, you'll, you'll focus on that specific like weight number or whatever. Exactly. I think, I think we need to keep our goal broad as in, make sure your health is good, you know, um, not necessarily, I need to be able to lift 550 pounds. That's my goal. No, that's not a good goal to have. You figure out your own body. And speaking of figuring out your own body, I wanted to just touch on something real quick. Um, there are, there are medical professionals out there called functional med medicine specialists, and they can do, um, like blood work for you and things like that. Um, and they can tell you, you know, what kind of foods are right for your body and which ones are not. So like, I've got a, a good friend and he's, he's been to one and he said, you know, we can sit here and he said, I can drink all this beer and you can't. And I just can't eat a turkey sandwich and you can. And I'm like, wow, that's so different. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, know, know thyself, uh, before doing any of these things. Um, I am going to wrap us up here. I just want to say, um, let's keep our, our minds focused on our health um, and not just for ourselves, but for the people who love us and want to be around us more um, for a longer period of time on this earth. And I appreciate uh, James and Peggy coming on here and, and doing this with us. Um, side note, Baker Prosthetics and Orthotics uh, sponsors this podcast, and they are here for you.